Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Anthony Mead, director of the Moreland Gallery here at Transylvania University. And in just a moment, I will turn it over to our curator um, and lead for tonight's talk and alum of Transylvania University, Josh Porter. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to say uh, a quick thank you, not only to you for joining us, but also to Josh for curating a wonderful exhibition, Masks, Masculinity Reimagined, and to the artists that are currently on display in that exhibition in Moreland Gallery that runs until January 27th. Um, please join us at any time, Monday through Friday, um, from noon to five to check out that show or for any of the special events that are associated. And for the rest of it, I will turn it over to Josh um, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Anthony. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here for this um, our virtual artist panel. Um, and so a few quick um, notes. We do have closed captioning available, um, so you can turn that on um, at the bottom there. We also are going to be doing Q&A, and so you can kind of um, submit questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom. Um, we'll look at that um, more towards the end of the um, seminar. And then um, this tonight's talk is also part of uh, Transy's um, Creative Intelligence series. So we want to thank um, Craig Partain and Creative Intelligence uh, for sponsoring this talk. Um, and also wanted to invite you all to the gallery hop reception next Friday in the gallery, the tw January 20th, um, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I will be doing a public curator's talk that night at around 6 o'clock. Um, so I invite you all to come to that if you can. Um, but after that, I will introduce our two artists. And so first we have Justin Corver. Um, and Justin is an artist and educator living and working in San Antonio, Texas. He is originally from a small town in the northwest corner of Iowa, but eventually moved to Texas to pursue his MFA at the University of Texas at San Antonio, where his thesis focused on the critique of the social construction of masculinity. Now he teaches as a senior lecturer of art at Texas A&M San Antonio, where he facilitates courses in art appreciation, Latinx art appreciation, visual studies, photography, and honors. Then we also have transdisciplinary weaver John Paul Morbido, um, who engages queerness, ethnicity, and the sacred through the medium of tapestry reimagined in the digital age. Their work outputs woven forms, moving images, and relational actions that look towards a future past horizon where one can exalt queer grace. They have exhibited internationally and are in many collections. They are the editor of Weaving Beyond the Binary, a special issue of the International Peer Review Journal, um, Textile, Cloth, and Culture. Morbido serves as director at large for the American Tapestry Alliance and poly chair for the Queer and Trans Caucus for Art. They hold a BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Morbido is assistant professor and head of textiles at the School of Art at Kent State University, and John Paul Morbido is represented by Patricia Suido Gallery out of Los Angeles, California. So I want to thank both of these artists for being here. And um, each of them actually have a quick five minute presentation to sort of share about their work. Um, and so we will start with Justin. So if you want to go ahead with your quick presentation, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I titled this very brief introduction to some of my work as uh, the outdoors as a space of masculine performativity. Um, because I think of my work as often being born out of uh, the materials and politics of different spaces. And recently I've been really focused on the outdoors and like the culture of the outdoors and the way we uh, use the outdoors as a performative space. Um, and let me go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to start with, with this work, which I call uh, He and Him, uh, because I, I think that th this series of prints encapsulates a lot of the ideas that I've been thinking about recently. Um, I started with targets because it was like uh, a tool for training sight and practicing our sight uh, and associated with kind of these uh, masculine performances, the the need to perform masculinity, the 
the development of the skills of masculinity. Um, and you can see that the text here uh, reads, he carefully lined up his sight. The fine hairs on his neck stood up. He felt as though he was a target. Um, I thought it was interesting in this case to have the pronouns remain unlinked. The importance of pronouns in the way that we navigate gender is important to many people. Um, and I think that when that pronoun isn't linked to a noun, it makes a lot of ambiguity in this relationship, right? Who is the he that's being referred to? Is it the targeted or is it the targeter? So which side of that relationship you're on? And my hope is that um, that the viewer imagines themselves in both positions and that that kind of imaginative theater is, is a kind of empathy building exercise. Um, and those ideas were kind of developed into works like this. These are a series of embroidered photographs. So I print the photograph out and then I poke hundreds and hundreds of holes into the photograph. And then I hand embroider with pearled cotton through them. Again, you see that the pronouns emerge. We have both of the characters, the buck, and also my fictitious hunter, who I also call buck. And they both identify as he, him, his. Um, and then again, the, the slippage of pronouns here, the them in this case, is it the two men? Is that what's being filled? Is it the relationship between the humans and the deer? Um, I, I think the ambiguity is really useful and interesting in thinking about how to live uh, in kinder ways together. And I also wanted to show you some of the, the surface of these works and the way that the materiality of the embroidery creates a shift in the images. I think like in this image, you can see through the embroidery. And as you walk up to the image, the embroidery kind of moves forward and holds your attention in a primary way. Um, and then I also installed them over this white on white camo. And I think of that space as a white space. Uh, I mean that of course, literally and metaphorically. Work that we see at Transy. So there are targets that deer, that hunters use to, to practice so that they can uh, kill the deer efficiently. So you need to know where those vital organs are if you're going to do that. Um, in this case, the, the stain is actually uh, bleach. So it's a kind of destructive textile process that strips the color out of this digitally woven tapestry. And then over that bleach mark, um, I've hand beaded it with little kind of gold colored seed beads and then clear bugle beads that make that kind of wound almost shimmer. And then I think of the partner piece to that work as, as this piece where we have the vitals of the hunter, right? So everybody is being made kind of vulnerable. And I think because those clothes are there, it's without a body inside them, we all kind of imagine wearing those clothes and and what it would feel like to be in that position. And so I hope that we begin to think of ourselves in more uh, empathetic relationships with one another, with the natural world um, that we all inhabit together. And then I use these works to create these new spaces that I hope um, create a kind of, they use the language of binary gender, but I hope that they create a, a kind of conflict within that. And then there's an option for the, the gradation of gender between these poles. So that is what I have in my presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justin, for that great introduction to your practice and sort of the way you frame your work. Um, so next we have John Paul Morabito, if you want to up your presentation. All 
All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to spend uh, some time in conversation. Um, so before I jump into the actual presentation, just to note about my overall practice, I've been working in um, the production of textiles through weaving and tapestry for about the past two decades. And so my practice encompasses both digital weaving and uh, analog outputs. And all of that is engaging with um, thinking through a variety of queer experiences. Um, I wanted to spend the time that we have here focusing on the body of work that's presented in the exhibition at the Moreland Galleries. And so this is a series entitled For Felix after uh, the late Felix Gonzalez Torres. And this body of work began in, um, in response to the conditions that we were living under in March of 2020. So I've been working on another body of work um, that required certain technological access that I lost. And then I began searching for ways to, um, to continue making, to continue having an art practice and this body of work emerged. And so, um, you know, I'm a queer person who was born in you know, the early 80s. And for those in my is very much about thinking about that, about thinking about the ways in which um, that plague holds a kind of um, psychic jail around us as a community. And in many ways, the rise of the COVID-19 crisis kind of called this to mind. And I know many queer people at that period of time were very much feeling like this ghost had risen again. I don't consider this work to be about COVID-19 or about um, that, that particular moment, but it was a moment that called to mind another moment. So these tapestries are woven with um, hand-dyed cotton yarns and they're woven and uh, removed from the loom before they are complete. And so that leaves these lengths of threads or fringe that come out from the textile. And those threads are then um, threaded with glass beads to produce this beaded fringe. And I think that this is a tangent of the beaded curtains that Gonzalo Torres was producing in his work. And then so within the beaded curtains, you have these industrially fabricated beads that are hung within passageways and bodies move between them. And in his work, there is this idea about participation and um, these um, these metaphors for passage between these realms of life and death as both he and his partner were um, dealing with the consequences of living and dying with AIDS. Um, and this body of work is not no recreation of that series, but rather is a tangent. So it originates in response to that body of work, but moves out into an entirely different direction. And so whereas his work is about um, participation, this work is about the discrete object. And I feel like it's creating um, horizontal connections between queer conceptual art and the embodied medium of craft. Um, the idea of focusing on the fringe is really important to me. I consider the fringe to be you know, the queerest element of any textile. So it's present, but it's not fully integrated within the tapestry. Like it's not, it's there and it's not. Um, and it can be understood as this kind of border that exists between the tapestry and the wall. It's a transitional space, it's a liminal space. And that's something that is an echoing or a retracing of the gestures that Gonzalez Torres is making where, again, we're locating that body of work within the passageway, within the idea of being um, a, a point or an interface that exists between one space and another. Uh, these works are all produced through um, a kind of uh, informed improvisation. And so I create systems that I then improvise within. Um, the use of color is uh, very much improvised and one step provides the scaffolding to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. So everything is, is produced um, kind of in 
in the moment. Um, and within these bodies of work, I'm, I'm working very formally, I'm working very responsive to material and color to produce the overall form. But I'm thinking about these works as accessing a kind of queer visuality through the glittering bombastic quality of them, through their hypersaturation. Um, they kind of exist in a space where they just maybe just maybe a bit too much, um, and which is a, a visual aesthetic that is very much associated with um, queer aesthetics. Um, and uh, another thing that I've been thinking about with this body of work as, you know, how to position them as, uh, as memorials um, and as sites of queer mourning and how that, how that might be visualized in a kind of contrapuntal way. So rather than thinking about mourning as being something somber, like how might the ecstatic visuality speak to that space where joy and sorrow meet, that space where um, the ecstatic and the traumatic um, happen simultaneously. And a lot of the visual decisions that are being made here are um, being done to accentuate that. And so again, I think about them as memorials and these material love letters to, um, to a generation that we lost um, and to uh, those that are still um, living in the reality of a plague that uh, never fully ended. And so I think I'll leave it there and uh, we can move on to our conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much, John Paul. Both those presentations were very helpful, and I love hearing artists talk about their own work. Um, so obviously, I enjoyed a lot of that. Um, so I guess my first question that came came to mind hearing both of you all speak is really thinking about fiber and textiles, because both of you deal with them in very different ways, um, and so and use them in very different ways. So I'd be very interested to hear from you all of maybe like how you got to working with fiber in the way that you did. Um, and sort of why you continue to work with it um, and why and sort of, yeah, what that physical material um, does to your practice and to your work and sort of the importance of it for you. I can I can start, but I, if if you want to go for it, John, Paul, I also don't want to step on top of you. Okay. Um, I guess for me, I, I entered fibers through clothing. So I think my work often responds to existing things in the world. I find that like, I'm not an artist who wants to start with like a lump of clay or with like a blank canvas. Um, I want to start with a material that means something culturally already. And then I almost think of my work as like inserting myself into the conversation of that object or, or, you know, uh, adding my two cents to what that thing means. Uh, so early on, I was really interested in identity and clothing is such an important. Embroidery was such a natural way to add to it. In terms of the textile arts, um, embroidery is completely decorative, right? Like painting, it's an addition to the surface that doesn't serve the functionality of it. It's about aesthetics. Um, so I thought it was a way of adding a layer on top of, uh, of a garment that I could comment on. And then um, the learning more about embroidery, the things like the hats were kind of like the starting point. Um, and then I started to apply that skill set to other objects. So recently that's meant a lot of embroidery and paper. Um, but it's serving a similar kind of function, I think, where it's it's kind of commenting on existing material. Yeah, exactly that. And and in that case, the the clothing I'm using to comment is uh, literally my dad's uh, working hat. It's his business logo, which I think I made in Microsoft Word when I was like literally a child. Uh, <laughs> and then he used it for forever. Um, and then I took his hat, which was covered in dirt and sweat and all those things. I thought of it as like 
the action painting, right? Like it's it's uh, more de Kooning than de Kooning because it's like so macho and so about the body and so about fluidity. Um, and then I added those like lovely decorative little sweet and as I look at it now, very naive uh, <laughs> embroidery on top of it. Um, and I think that created this like kind of contrast to the material that was already there. But then it also becomes this hybrid object that's something of the uh, masculinity that my father was and something of the masculinity that I uh, approach the world with. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely see that sort of additive process of sort of the way you use embroidery and cross stitch, um, you know, because especially with your photographs too, like the photographs exist and then you're sort of stabbing them and manipulating them with this needle and embroidering into them. So yeah, I definitely see that coming through. Um, so I learned to weave about uh, 20 somewhat years ago um, when I was in high school and I just really took to the process and found it to be a meaningful way for making work. Um, I, I specifically utilize the term transdisciplinary weaver as a means of talking about being both um, dedicated and um, uh, or polyamorously dedicated rather to uh, a, a practice of making. And so the, there's a way of being both focused and expansive where weaving has the capacity to encompass many modes of making within itself. And in many ways it can be understood, like you'll hear people who weave talk about it with a, an amorous loyalty that positions it almost as being an identity. And I, I think about ways in which weaving can be considered an ontological practice. And this is something that um, can get broader and broader and broader where there's um, there's modes of meaning that are associated with this uh, practice of, of making grids and making textiles and making form with uh, with those tools. One of the things that I um, I'm particularly drawn to with uh, with weaving and specifically with the term tapestry is the kind of liminal position that um, these practices have held within the history of art. So there's um the scholar Ty Smith has brought up the notion of textiles as being kind of tangents of art where they're situated adjacently to, but outside of art. And I find as a queer person, that is very much um, what queer experience is to be adjacent, but to be also outside um, and how that kind of liminality can be used as a catalyst for making meaning. I'm really interested in the fallen glory of the medium of tapestry. So you have this like glorious history of heroic tapestries in the Renaissance that hold this important um, position. And then there's this fall that happens. And uh, what, what, what does it mean to re-exalt that? What does it mean to look at something that has been cast aside, that has been placed in a tangential, marginal um, situation, and then to use that as, as a, a site to, to create meaning? And that, that's one of the things that I think textiles uh, does for me. And, you know, textiles have the capacity to be both formal and aesthetic, and conceptual, but they also connect to the quotidian lived world. And so we have the capacity to draw upon both the languages of form, the language of abstraction, the language of conceptual art, but also the language of our lived world, um, the language of our embodied world. And I think a lot of people who hold minoritized minority and marginalized identities are drawn to textiles because of their capacity to talk about the places that we occupy within the world. And that's very much why I'm working with this material. It, it enables me to talk about the political and social position that I'm working through. And I'm able to do it through things like form and aesthetics, but the textile itself holds that political meaning that I find to be really important. Yeah, that's, I definitely see that. And especially, I think it's really cool seeing too, not just the textile itself, but also how you're using that textile, like using technology or being very analog. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm getting a phone call. Um, that scared me. I, but yeah, sorry sort of putting those two together of technology and the analog um, 
especially with fibers, I think there's sometimes they're very intentional about wanting to call me. Um, yeah, because I think both of you use um, or sort of embrace that sort of connection of technology and analog. There's a little bit of both in those works. Um, you know, if uh, Justin, with your cross stitching, you know, I saw like you design those digitally and then you sort of put those points in digitally, but then you physically are embroidering it. And then John Paul, you were talking about how, you know, these are, um, or these pieces, I don't, you said, are, is the top portion hand woven as well for these pieces these are they're all hand woven these are all analog i have oh, i yeah work your other works are the digital capacities yeah. yeah but like right. in your work as a whole you sort of embrace both of those sort of worlds um which i just find really interesting thinking about fiber as um yeah as a medium and how that sort of plays out um Cool. And then another question I actually had for both of you is when I was looking at a lot of sort of the things you all have said about your work, um, you both have actually talked a lot about the inspiration of bell hooks, which I think holds a lot of importance locally for a lot of people here as well, um, especially in her direct interpretations of artists like Gonzalez Torres um, and his work um, as a pedagogy of mourning, I think you mentioned. Um, but also, Justin, you've mentioned the way that she advocates for education as something that can lead to liberation. Um, and so when I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about sort of um, what other scholars or writers or artists you all are sort of inspired by um, and sort of you take with you with your work that you're thinking about um, in your practice. Oh, I can't see in dead air. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I think I draw inspiration from a, a lot of people. I think that I am constantly It creates this incredible uh, critique of the systems that we all have to live inside of. Um, I, I do love bell hooks. Recent, recently, I've been um, engaging more with people like uh, Tara Donovan um, and um, Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, Timothy Morton. And I'm trying to think about how this this question of like the outdoors. Relationship to other people. What does it mean to be in relationship with the natural world? Um, that's kind of where I see my work is heading. Um, but yeah, I'm, I am always looking at other people and, and responding to other people. I I always thought it was weird when people would say, like, I don't want to be too inspired by somebody else. And I was like, what? Like, no, you need to look at a thousand people and then you'll you'll be inspired by all of them. And <laughs> and that's the goal in my mind. So I mean with uh with regard to theory and um, and what scholars have have contributed, you know, I um, I look a lot to um, to uh, Jose Zapa Munoz, um, thinking very much about cruising utopia and the the notion of queer futurity and the idea of this this then and there, and, and Munoz brings up this notion of queerness being a horizon. And so the horizon is being both a space that we're moving toward and moving away from. And that, that positionality is, um, is really interesting to consider um, about the, the fact that it is always beyond us, where, where the queerness is always in the state of becoming. And one of the things that I've always really appreciated about Munoz is like, you know, the first time I read it, I found a lot of, um, I'm gonna use the term Anglo queer theory to be um, incredibly um, depressing. Uh, for a lack of a better word, 
Um, and it's also just not reflective of my of my own experience. And so the there is this this space where there is um, this this theorization that because queer people are not producing children, there is no future, and you know we we can go out from there. But what uh, what Munoz is is introducing is an idea of futurity. So and that's a, that's about possibility. It's about imagination. It's about thinking towards something. And I mean, you know, I'm simplifying it very, very, very greatly here. But I'm I'm really um, really engaged by this these ways in which temp which queer temporalities can start to enter into there because there is this breaking of the idea of a presentness, uh, breaking of an idea of a um, of a linear chronology and entering into spaces of anachronism, entering into spaces where the past is the future, the future is the past, and we're we're reaching towards both. And that reaching, that dream is um, is something about a utopia. And I'm really, really engaged with a lot of his writing there. Um, he's also put forward notions about disidentification, which I think for queer people is hugely politically powerful to disidentify with patriarchy, to disidentify with masculinity, to disidentify with manhood. Like those are important tools that, uh, or disidentification with whiteness, just, those are really important political tools for us to be using within the public sphere. Um, I've turned a lot to Renaud Lorenz, who is a theorist out of Europe, and um, they're writing on drag, they're positioning drag as a, as a queer methodology, right? And so not just the drag that we see that's associated with pageantry perform performativity and gender play, but the drag that is associated with um, with queer methodologies of retracing and queer methodologies of world making. And, um, and how that can be manifested in other ways through other media, through other actions. Um, so I'm really interested in that theory. Um, Sarah Ahmed's uh, queer phenomenology, I find to be quite powerful, um, particularly the orientations towards objects and this idea about um, orientation that, that, you know, where you are facing, what is behind you, what you can perceive, like all of that uh, we can bring into an artistic practice to think about um, how to produce meaning. And if, I mean, of uh, course, I, you know, look, go ahead, go ahead. All right, you finished, sorry. I was kind of I was just, <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, what I was thinking when you were talking about this, I, like this disidentification, and also you were talking about the sort of more um, theoretical notions of drag. Um, I definitely was thinking about your tapestries, and I think you've talked about them as sort of like these at representing this abstract drag of like, representations or reference without okay. physically representing the bodies. Um, and so I think you talked about that a little bit with the Four Felix series, um, especially thinking about like loss and mourning. I think it's really connected to that. Um, but I think you can also, um, it's really interesting to think about that idea of um, abstract drag of being, you know, the idea of drag without the physical body of um, for being present. So I think, you know, people had that notion, as, you know, when you hear drag, you think of the popular understanding. And so I think thinking about it in a more theoretical sense is just very fascinating to think about it connecting to objects as opposed to people. Especially when you think about formativity and, you know, because a lot of times, you know, that the, the um, the um, traditional understanding of drag is that idea of like of what you're putting on your body what you're presenting to other people sort of how you're doing that um, which I honestly found a lot of connections with that and like the materials that were being used in the show there's all these beads there's glitter and some of um, the other artists work um, and then but also thinking about like this idea of clothing that you're talking about Justin with the hats um, and also Betsy Odom's pieces with um the baseball glove and the shoulder pads. I'm really thinking about sort of the ways that we are presenting gender and drag in other ways through what we're putting on and the materials that we're using. Um, so I definitely think those are really fascinating to sort of think about. Um, and I especially love, I think in your statement, John Paul, the part where you talk about um, um, using um, drag in all its bombastic and glittering glory. I just really love that phrase, the bombastic and glittering glory. So especially like extravagance um, is something that also came to play in this exhibition that um, I just really love to think about and associating with gender and masculinity as something that's 
you know, not encouraged for um, masculine people um, to be extravagant, to be sort of um, um, expressive in that way and sort of saying, well, no, who's like, who's saying that that can't be and that extravagance can be for everyone and is a good thing and can be fun. Um, and that, you know, that idea being over the top, you talked about your work earlier that you love the fact that it's kind of lives in that world of possibly being too much. Um, and I think that's something that like people can strive for of realizing that these boundaries are kind of being pre-made and you can sort of push against those in that way. Um, so that sort of made me think about that a lot. It reminds me of um, Susan Sontag's notes on camp and the mm -hmm. way that camp provides like a, a type of alternative space to like good and bad taste that it's um, like the, the joy and the pleasure taken in things that are seen as too much or, or overwrought or, um, outside the the confines of good taste but then cultivating that sensibility right like I I think a very transformative moment for me in my art career was realizing like that I could choose the thing that was tacky and that I could make the tacky desirable and I could make the tacky something that um did a kind of intellectual labor that changed the world that I lived in and it, that it wasn't just this kind of like silly thing it was it it had a uh, presence and power in the world um and that there was it it makes me feel like I'm engaged in that process that I'm the person who's helping to create the value there if it didn't have value already or something mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think about that too when I was thinking about all of the materials in the show, how, you know, especially with fiber work, it is typically a medium associated with women and women's work and a very feminine activity of embroidery and weaving. Um, and so thinking about what happens when there's a show about masculinity where that's sort of the primary medium that's existing, you know, is this idea of being um, very hand, uh, very hands-on, very analog in that way. Um, I just really love sort of challenging that um, multiple times in the show when people are like, oh, like your show is called Masculinity Reimagined. I, they have this preconceived notion about what they're about to see. And so I really love that when they go to the, go to the exhibition, they're like, oh, this is not what I expected, especially, you know, due to the shine, due to the glitter, due to the extravagance and due to sort of these um, over the top elements that I just really love together and how these works kind of are in conversation with each other. Um, and I did have another question actually for Justin's work. When I was in there earlier talking to, in the gallery earlier talking to people, we were again talking about that physicality of the medium of that fiber, but with those photographs um, of sort of the violence that's sort of implied with these, you know, obviously it's hunting, which is a inherently violent act, but also this idea of like the embroidery of where you're physically stabbing all of these holes throughout this image with a needle um, to do this sort of embroidery. And so I was wondering sort of what your thoughts on the, the role of violence in some of your work and how that plays out. Yeah, um, I was part of a, a book club and we read this book called The Subversive Stitch. And uh, in it, they talk about um, like the the way that embroidery has been seen at different points in history. And uh, apparently embroidery made the Victorians rather uncomfortable because of that kind of like repeated stabbing motion. It was seen as this possible like feminine violence or even this kind of like ersatz sex act, that it was the repeated penetration of a sur surface. And uh, it was like, women engaged in the penetration of a surface. So that was, um, you know, it gave uh, prudes anxiety. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that there is something there about that, you know, perforation of the surface again and again. Um, but equally, I would say that, you know, uh, the stitch in the surface can be a kind of mending or it could be a suture, right? And I think that that idea of sewing as a as a 
as a bringing together of material is um, it's like equally present within the work and within uh, the medium. So I think that's a possibility as well. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely see that sort of duality of like the violence and the mending. I think there's a lot of sort of that existing in this show of sort of, you know, dualities and sort of challenging binary understandings of things um, sort of just ever present in this show. Um, you know, obviously of gender and rethinking how, reimagining sort of how we think about masculinity and gender, um, but also our binary understandings of arts and crafts, of medium, of fiber, of photography, um, you know, thinking about some of the other artists' work that might not fit directly into a certain type of medium. In our everyday lives and sort of what we're experiencing um, through that is definitely a through line that I saw um, through this, through the work in the show and through your all's work as well. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. We can, I'm going to hop over and see um, what people are asking and see if that sort of encourages more conversation. So we have one question um, from Robert Morgan that says, uh, John Paul, do you find younger generations of queer culture want to escape the dark shadow of the history of AIDS and being defined by that epidemic so that they might recoil um, from your messages in your art concerning HIV and AIDS? So kind of thinking about how do you think younger generations are kind of trying to avoid this history of AIDS and the epidemic and trying to avoid talking about it? Um, and sort of how do you maybe see them as reacting to your work? Oh, here we go. Um, I'm, I'm not going to put words into the mouth of another generation. I, I can't mm -hmm. speak to um, what what that experience is. Certainly there are distinct generational experiences. My generation experienced something of being defined by a, a certain uh, a certain space. Like we, the, the, we came of age through that. We came into our queer identities with AIDS being an ever present death sentence. And the ghost of that is still present. I mean, queer people on first dates are trading medical histories, you know, saying who's on what medication and whatnot. And like that, that is still a reality. Um, I don't know how, uh, how much it can be separated from uh, contemporary queer experience, even with people taking PrEP medication. And like, it's still an ever present um, experience. So I don't, I don't know how, um, I don't know how uh, a younger generation would be reacting, but the contention with HIV and AIDS is still a present experience for um, everyone who holds a queer identity. But part of part of this is that you know there are things that we should not forget. There there are moments in time that we should not forget. This was a, 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 the equivalent of a genocide, and it's something that does need to be contended with. And you know, if you're recoiling from it, why are you recoiling from it? Why don't, it's like, it's not only been a celebratory experience to be uh, a queer person. This this was this was a, a horrible, horrific moment in time. We lost a generation of people. There is a reason we don't have queer elders because of this moment in time. We should not be forgetting about it. Um, we should not be, uh, just trying to live with uh, with the smiles and the sparkles and the shines, but it's you know it's not it's not gone. The mm -hmm. pandemic, the the epidemic is not over. It's still present. It is still very very much present, and it's very much a reality for queer people, regardless of their generation. So. Um, I do think this is an important conversation to continue to have. You know, there's a, a recent text that came out from uh, by the uh, queer author Joseph Ogbenson. It's called Virology, and he's talking about a lot of different um, things with the poetics of of, uh, of uh, microbes. But one of the things that he's he's questioning is like, when does a pandemic end? When does an epidemic end? And it doesn't. It shifts and it changes how we interact with it and how it defines our lives but it doesn't end. And there's a point within that, that viruses and microbes are, um, they exist and transverse in the social space between bodies. And so we do have to think about our relationship to them. Um, and that might change, but it doesn't make them gone. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that definitely answers the question that way. Um, and so my follow up question is actually kind of what this other question is. Um, and so we'll start with you, John Paul, and then go to Justin. Um, this is sort of saying, what are some educative benefits or points that you hope that the audience um, can pull from both of your works whenever they look at it? And so I guess for you, John Paul, thinking about what do you want the audience to get when they look at these tapestries? Um, so my original follow up was you reframing that first question of what do you want a younger queer generation to get from looking at your work? Um, but then I think you can also sort of think about what you want audiences as a whole to sort of get from these pieces and sort of take away from them, um, both educative, but also sort of just like personal and intimate um, sort of interactions. You know, I think there's many different meanings that can happen when different people to come to come to different works of art and i don't necessarily want to prescribe what that experience is going to be for every individual that encounters my work i'm working from a place of intention um, i'm working through a certain positionality through certain understandings of certain histories um, and having a certain conversations with those histories that are resonant within the work. However, different people who hold different identities and different uh, even temporal generational positionalities are going to perceive different things in the work. And that's, that's how an artwork functions. Like it produces new meanings by having those of, of different um, identities come and experience the work. Um, ultimately, I'm making work for queer people to have a space to um, experience that, that duality of, of, of mourning and celebration. And you know, that's what the work is about. That's what the work is for. But again, I'm not prescribing a singular experience for the work. They can be appreciated for their aesthetic properties. They can be appreciated as being uh, formal objects. They can, like, there's a lot of ways in which uh, a viewer can interact with the work. Um, and experience it. And there's multiplicities of meanings. Um, different audiences bring different experiences and not every meaning is for every audience. Like it's not, and I don't think we need to expect work to have a singular meaning for every single person. Like it's not, if it's not made for you, doesn't mean you can't appreciate it, but maybe that meaning isn't available for you because you don't hold that identity and that's okay. Um, and I'm okay with that being present in my own work. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that sentiment, especially, you know, from a curatorial's perspective, um, it's very interesting kind of finding that line of how much do you tell people about an artwork and how much you let people find out for themselves. Um, and so I think that, yeah, finding that line is always very, because it's, again, like that question someone was asking, like, people desire for answers, but sometimes it's almost better to not give them those answers and sort of let people find on their own. Um, through experiencing it. So yeah, I definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, but I guess, J Justin, if you want to talk, I guess think about intentions behind the work is also sort of, sort of a good way to frame that question. Yeah, I, I, I would take what you just said even a step further that it's not only about um, whether I want to give, like I want everyone to have all the information I have about the work, but I'm also not capable of giving them everything, right? Because an artwork, just like every object in the world and just like our relationship to every person in the world is a relationship, right? So everyone, like Jean-Paul was saying, brings who they are to that work of art, right? And I can't possibly know every aspect of every person. So to that's the, the difficulty with mapping, like what does this thing mean, right? Is that like, well, we know what half of the equation is, but the other half of the equation is the viewer. And the viewer is an incredibly slippery thing. Like we don't know who that is, and we also want to make uh, viewing spaces that are incredibly diverse spaces, right? Where what we mean by the viewer is an intentionally expansive term, right? Where that where many people feel themselves to be viewers. And I think that's a problem that we've experienced um, 
historically, but certainly we experience in the present as well, that not everyone is made to feel like a viewer in different spaces, right? That different spaces tell you you're not supposed to be a viewer there. That's why representation and diversity is so important. Yeah, those are wonderful answers. Thank you. I definitely, yeah, this idea of, you know, what, um, who spaces are for and sort of who gets accepted into them and who is not, I definitely think is also part of that question of how people can interact with our works. Um, so I think both of you brought up really good points in that. Um, someone else brought a question. Um, I'm going to read it first and then we can maybe go from there. So uh, John Paul speaks of queer individuals existing in a liminal space. They are part of something, but standing somewhat apart. And Justin's work deals with the theme of being hunted as both the hunter and the huntee. Um, both artists then kind of bring up this this theme of being of alienation, I guess, to so being like set apart. Um, and then do they see their artwork as an attempt to ameliorate that condition? Or do they primarily seek to simply acknowledge that condition? Um, so I guess this idea of, and John Paul's work of being, um, you know, a tangent, you kept using that word tangent. Um, I think that question might be thinking about like, do you see that as a positive of being apart and being separate, like, you know, connected, but separate in that way? Um, you know, I think it definitely is sort of more nuanced than that. But I think that's kind of what that question is dealing at. And Justin kind of same with you of this idea of you know, the predator and the prey and whether it's just acknowledging that situation, do you want people to go into that and sort of change their mindset? Um, so I guess we can start with um, John Paul, if that's all right, um, and then move on, Justin. One of the things that I think about the, the function of art is to bear witness to humanity, to bear witness to something. Um, and through that bearing witness, um, we are able to make meaning or we're able to wrestle with what that what that is um i don't necessarily i I, mean, I don't have a problem with being in a liminal position i think there's so many wonderful things that come out of um the the space of queer people being outside of the norm and when we give that up what do we become you know that's certainly something to consider but you know i <laughs> I would say I'm more, I'm bearing witness to something. I'm, I'm making space to consider something and what happened, like uh, art is, it's, it's a question upon a question upon a question. It's not an answer. I'm not telling anyone how to think. You know, I'm pulling together um, dialectic relationships and uh, materials and forms that, um, that ask questions to which there are not clean and clear answers. And if someone feels that the, the purpose is to um, activate a, a way of shifting an outsiderness. Uh, that, that, that's a fine way of responding. Um, but it's it's about posing the question. It's about bearing witness to the condition and letting viewers wrestle with what that means. And um, not, maybe not even necessarily what to do with that, but just wrestling with what it means. Yeah, I, I think that there's something here about the question of um, like the the politics of what is the center and um, and how we negotiate that idea. I think that, you know, my work for a really long time had a lot to do with m modernity and, and trying to like you know, unpack all of this baggage of the 20th century, like what was all this stuff and, and, and what kind of myths did it believe in? And um, increasingly, I felt like there, there isn't a center in the world, right? We can't go to a center, the world is filled with centers. And then I also feel like we can apply that same idea to ourselves, right? Let I think intersectional identity as a concept tells us that who we are and how we relate to other people in the world is a complex negotiation within ourselves and without ourselves, right? That um, that question of how we move through the world is in flux. So at one moment, I feel like suddenly I am cast as 
the predator and another moment I feel like I am cast as the prey and I think that that's actually an experience that a lot of people can project themselves into right and and if you don't feel like you can project yourself into that that space I I would I don't know I I would encourage more introspection because I think like we've all been the problem right and we've all um we've all we've all been the problem and we've all been part of the solution and we're negotiating that. So I think that that's kind of why I'm, I'm wanting to think about this unclear relationship between the hunter and the prey, right? Um, because I think it lets us practice this with objects. And then I think we're, we're better equipped to be you know, more careful with one another, right? Like I, you know, if, if somebody feels some kind of way about my work that, you know, that's fine. Like it's a thing, it can take it, right? <laughs> Versus uh, I, I think they get to work out some of those feelings and, and my hope, what they take away, which I think was the earlier question that I guess I'm finally getting to, I, I hope what they take away is like to, to be a little less certain in the way that they approach other people. Yeah, I love that. I definitely think that idea of introspection is very important. Um, when you think, especially when, you know, when you're looking at artwork, you know, you should always kind of think about how you're connecting to it and how you're relating to it um, and maybe placing yourself in the position of the subject. Um, I think it's always a very fascinating way to interact with art. Um, so I, we have a few minutes. So I'm going to have one final question, um, again, kind of for both of you, because I think you can both sort of talk about it in different ways, um, is really thinking about this importance of lineage and history. Um, so I think, you know, John Paul in your work, very much thinking about um, sort of queer elders, especially you talked about a lot and how that we don't have as many um, due to the due to HIV and AIDS. And then Justin thinking like very specifically about like familial relationships. And you talk about your father and with those dad hats, um, sort of thinking about that. Um, so we'll start um, with Justin this time. If you want to talk about that sort of um, importance of lineage, and then we'll end with John Paul. Yeah, I think earlier in the talk, I, I talked about how I like to start with uh, an object that has a history and means something already in the world. And I think that that's how I work conceptually as well. So I think like, you know, I'm starting with my own set of experiences, all of my own bad, my own, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think we um, inherit a lot of that, you know, that we are all born in a place and a time with the people in our lives. And um, uh, Dave Hickey wrote this essay, The Importance of Remembering Andy, where he talked about Andy Warhol's work as a, as a technique for making the world safe for Andy Warhol. Like he made all these things to try to make who Andy Warhol was, which was, uh, a, a, you know, a queer immigrant artist, a safe thing to be in the world. And I think that, uh, I often think of my art as doing a very similar thing is that it's kind of, um, negotiating with the world to make it a place that is, um, feels approachable to me or or makes makes a little corner of it that I can control or um ugh, control is an ugly word but a, a world that I can affect in some way so my practice within my practice I I get to change things I I get to decide that it's covered in beads or that it's <laughs> you know gonna have camo or you know wh what if we introduce some lavender you know like um I get to make all those decisions and that's a very reassuring thing in light of the the chaos that is in the world around us and that we are all kind of born into which sounds like I think my life was terrible my life was wonderful I'm very privileged but you know just a negotiation so uh... I think lineage is a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting thing to consider because we have so many lineages. 
um, you know, we, we have a, a familial embodied blood lineage, we have a social lineage, a chosen lineage, and I think of, you know, myself having a, a, a queer lineage that I connect to, um, a lineage that has certainly been broken, and there's some attempt at finding solace of, of, um, of reckoning with uh with that sundering and and what it what it means to exist in the world in the aftermath of um such a such a break but you know i um i also have a i have a familial lineage and an ethnic lineage and i have an artistic lineage that connects to queer art history and an artistic lineage that connects to histories of weaving and i think all of them come together to inform the decisions that i'm making when i'm in the studio um, in in a number of different ways and you know one thing does not have to um it, it's not necessarily that they're mutually exclusive from from one another i think and i'm just going to divert here and, and uh, have a little tangent because it popped into my head i think you know the, the thing that i haven't really spoken about is is thinking about the idea of queer sacrality and queer grace and and using work to create spaces for an imagining of what that might be. Um, and that, I mean, that's another kind of absence and another kind of fracture that's happened. And so a lot of the work is, is very much engaged with, with creating that kind, of, uh, that kind of space. And in some ways that connects you to ideas about lineage and in other ways it, 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 it is its own independent thought. But that's, that's kind of where my, where my head is and where I'm, I feel like leaving things. Totally. Thank you so much. That's another great answer. Um, well, I think we are about at time. So I wanted to first thank both of you, both uh, John Paul and Justin, for being here and talking um, about your work. I really appreciate it myself. I've loved creating your work into the show. Um, it's been very fun, and I love going and looking at it all because it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if you Again, this exhibition is up until January 27th at the Moreland Gallery, so definitely stop by if you get a chance. Um, and so, yeah, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.